Greetings, everyone. Once again, to the China History Podcast, Laszlo Montgomery here with you as we continue our Ancient Dynasties overview. The three Bronze Age dynasties of China are behind us now, Xia, Shang, Zhou. All done with those. The Qin I rebroadcast last week to keep the continuity flowing. I'm estimating the entirety of the Han, cover to cover, we're looking at three, maybe four episodes. By this time in China, writing and record keeping was already very far advanced, so there's plenty that archaeologists have uncovered and studied that reveals in pretty reliable detail aspects of daily life in the Han court and the environs and around China. There's quite a bit of painstaking detail about almost every aspect of the goings-on during the period of Han China, from the 2nd century BC to the 3rd century AD. In previous podcasts, well, basically, because there wasn't much to grab onto, there was hardly the plethora of facts and details about those Bronze Age times that you begin to have with the Han. So, even skipping over most of the details from this point forward in China, each dynasty is chock full of stories, characters, battles, events, so it might take us multiple podcasts to cover each one. You've heard me mention Sima Qian in a number of podcasts. The Western Han was the period when he was actually living. So China's Herodotus lived from about 135 to 86 BC. So this time when we read from the uh, Shi Ji about what ancient China's greatest historiographer says about the Han emperors, this time he's describing historical events that happened just prior to and during his lifetime. Now, after we finish the Han, we're going to take a break from our dynasty overviews and reach into the grab bag and do a few random topics. I have to say I've received quite a bit of email asking me to go back to the way I used to do the podcast, jumping back and forth between ancient and modern periods. Today, we're going to look at the Western Han Dynasty, as it was called, from the time of the first emperor, Gaozu, to the death of his wife, Empress Liu, a.k.a. Liu Taihou who holds the dubious honor of being considered the cruelest, meanest, and most vengeful of all empresses of China. More about that later. This particular time period we'll look at today lasted from 207 BC to 180 BC. Only 27 years, but trust me when I say it's jam-packed with tons of history and significant moments. So what I think we'll do is sort of do what I did with the Zhou Dynasty, Part 1, where First, I'll give a general overview of the whole Han time period. We'll also see what history was going on concurrently in the West and perhaps elsewhere in Asia. I will look at the signature achievements of the Han, which, by the way, was sort of uh, like the Zhou in that it's broken up into Western and Eastern time periods. There's a brief interregnum when the infamous usurper Wang Mang grabbed power and ushers in the Xing dynasty, a one-hit wonder of a dynasty that was founded and perished with Wang Meng as its sole emperor. So, let's get started. Uh, From start to finish, the Han lasted for about four and a quarter centuries. You had 214 years of the Western Han, 197 years of the Eastern Han, with a 14-year period when Wang Meng established the Xing dynasty, separating the two periods. When the Eastern Han fell in 265 AD, it was followed by the fabled Three Kingdoms period, immortalized in the San Guo Yan Yi. What about elsewhere on planet Earth? Well, it was an incredibly big world, but it was sure starting to get smaller. During this time period, East met West for the first time. This was the time when we see the Silk Road and Chinese adventurers and traders were coming back to Chang'an, the capital, and telling of whole civilizations that existed in the West beyond the Himalayas. Civilizations where people lived in cities and had their own writing. As the Han Dynasty progressed from 206 BC to 265 AD, Buddhism spread to other parts of Asia and across China. You had the Second and Third Punic Wars, Rome during this time reached the height of its power, and all the names we most remember, Caesar, Pompey, Augustus, Cicero, Cato, Trajan, Antony, and Cleopatra, all lived and died during this time. However, during the final years of the Han, uh, Rome was well into a steep decline, and at the close of the Han, Rome was in complete chaos. Uh, Jesus Christ lived during this Han period. This was the period of the Jewish revolt against Rome and the diaspora that followed their eviction from Jerusalem. The Mayan culture was developing and on its way to reach its greatest heights. 
So let's start with the short-lived, brutal, repressive Qin dynasty. The mighty Qin Shi Huang's body is already cold inside his massive tomb with its 8,000 terracotta warriors. The second and third Qin emperors proved to be hardly the stuff their father was made of, and this imperial dynasty of China is falling apart after a little more than a decade after it was founded in 221 BC. The inhabitants of this empire were exhausted from the conscription work on the Great Wall, the palaces, the tombs, and other government projects. The people were taxed up to their eyeballs. The feudal lords, who had enjoyed so much power during the period of the Zhou, especially the Eastern Zhou, were more than a little disgruntled at having their power, their weapons, their political influence all taken from them. When Qin Shi Huang suddenly passed from the scene in 210 BCE, the former kingdoms began to reassert themselves again. Han historians had said of the Qin that they had failed to rule with righteousness and humanity, and had failed to realize that the qualities required of a ruler were not those of a conqueror. So when we talk about the founding of the Han dynasty, we begin with these two characters from Chinese history who were legends in their own time and whose exploits are taught in every history class and every school in the Chinese-speaking world. Here we introduce the founder of the Han dynasty, Liu Bang, and his nemesis, the powerful Xiang Yu. The stories and legends surrounding the battles for supremacy between Liu Bang and Xiang Yu are familiar to all students of Chinese history. Let's look at Liu Bang first. Well, what can I say? He was both a legend in his own time and still to this day. He was the first of only two commoners to rise to the level of emperor. That's in the entirety of Chinese history, imperial history anyway. He came from nothing, basically, and was blessed with quick wits, guts, determination, and heaven's favor. Now, around the time Liu Bang was ascending, we're talking 210, 209, to 207 BC thereabouts, the empire that Qin Shi Huang had cobbled together was now is the time when it was falling apart. Liu came from Fengxian, about 90 minutes north by car from present-day Xuzhou in Jiangsu. Back in Liu Bang's time, it was called Pei County. There's a great story about how he got the girl. He was a nobody living in Pei County when this wealthy and respectable lord moves to the town, and he had a beautiful daughter who he was looking to marry off to a good husband. Now this new guy in town, Lord Liu, invited some gentlemen to come to his house, and he had a local magistrate named Xiao He act as sort of an MC for the affair. The deal was that the cost of entrance to Lord Liu's was thousand coins. Otherwise, you had no chance to get close enough to Lord Liu to make an impact on him and get a chance to marry his daughter. Xiao He is at the entrance, taking gifts from suitors and recording everything, and in walks Liu Bang. Xiao He asks for his, you know, his entry fee, or you know, whatever you might call this thousand coins, and Liu Bang says to Xiao He, hey, you know, don't worry, he had 10,000 coins. Lord Liu, upon seeing Liu enter his villa personally welcomed him into the hall and gave him a seat of honor. So impressed was Lord Liu with Liu Bang's whole manner and the, the way he presented himself. Xiao He then realizes this guy Liu, who was already sitting down next to Lord Liu, he didn't have any, didn't even have a single copper cash on him, and had conned his way into the whole affair. And Liu Bang, who fortune favored, he ended up getting uh, the daughter Liu Zhi, who would later go down in history as the cruel Empress Liu. So, with his star rising, Liu Bang gets caught up in all the insurrections springing up against the dying Qin, and his natural charisma and leadership qualities make him one of the foremost rebel military leaders of his day. Ultimately, as far as delivering the final thrust of the sword into the already defeated Qin, it all came down to Liu Bang of the state of Han and Xiang Yu of the state of Chu. Xiang Yu, he was not a commoner. He came from an illustrious line of generals of the mighty Chu state. He was admired by those who served under him as a warrior and, and giant of a man, both physically and in the might of his will. Sima Qian can't rave enough about this guy and his accomplishments. Based on what the great historian said in the Shi Qi, Xiang Yu is considered one of China's greatest generals. He was born about a hundred kilometers to the east of Xuzhou in what is present-day Suqian County in Jiangsu. Through a series of victories over the Qin, who, by the way, nobody liked those guys, 
the Qing dynasty lasted only a little more than a decade, but it was not what you'd call a great time to be alive. So now that the Qing were on the run, nobody was on their side. Xiang Yu had declared himself the Xi Chu Ba Wang, or the hegemon, or lord protector of western Chu state. Western Chu in those days was spread out over parts of five provinces, and Xuzhou was where the Chu capital was located. He was the nephew of Xiang Liang, who had made a name for himself in the history books as an early rebel who had helped bring the Qin dynasty down. Xiang Yu took up his uncle's mantle after he was slain in battle. So Xiang Yu, he came from a good background and had proved himself as a leader of men on the battlefield. I think I can make this an all the Obang Xiang Yu podcast. That's how many great stories there are about their rivalry and ultimate showdown. So much drama. We, we really have to move on. But let me just give you the uh, main history. These two great leaders fought each other for what was a chance to fill the void left by the Qin. The Qin only held these Chinese kingdoms together as one single nation for merely a decade, but they proved it could be done. So the precedent was set, and both Liu Bang and Xiang Yu knew the awesome power an emperor could hold, as opposed to the king of a mere state. Let me quickly give you a couple interesting points about this. Chinese chess, as the Zhongguo Xiangqi, is divided into two sides. You don't say black or white or north or south. Chinese chess boards, even to this day, are divided down the center by a he or a river. One side is Chu He and the other side is Han Jie. This comes from this time period. Xiang Yu of Chu and Liu Bang of Han. In this showdown, this duel to the death, this fight to wear the crown of Qin Shi Huangdi was called the Chu Han Contention, or the Chu Han Xiang Zheng. For five years, between 206 and 202 BC, these two armies battled. Yeah, it was just one big battle after another. We'll come back another day and give this whole story of Liu Bang and Xiang Yu a more focused look. So many stories and legends. However, Liu Bang prevailed over Xiang Yu, and in 202 BC, Xiang Yu met his Waterloo at a place called Gai Xia, which is located in Lingbi in Anhui. Actually, not too far from where both Liu Bang and Xiang Yu were born. After this, Chu and Han unite, and Liu Bang becomes emperor and reigns as Emperor Gaozu, Han Gaozu. He reigned from 202 to 195 BC. Now, he isn't the same Gaozu as the Gaozu emperor who founded the Tang dynasty. You might recall the Gaozu emperor from the previous Wu Zetian podcast. Same name, different emperor. Han Gaozu did not enjoy a long reign by any reckoning, but long enough to stabilize China, put down rebellions here and there, and get everything working again. He had very able ministers, but mostly he just adopted the same old repressive legalist political systems as the Qin and slowly got things in order. So he kept all those old legalist principles, although it was uh, a more relaxed period than under the Qin emperor. On the good side, though, he lowered taxes, and everyone got a breather there. If you recall, under the Qin, all the hundred schools of thought, save legalism, were banned, and the, uh, and the books by Confucius and all his disciples and contemporaries were, had been burned. But under Emperor Gaozu, Confucianism made a comeback in a big way. There was a scholar at the court named Lu Gu who took the emperor from non-believer to believer of Confucian thought and ideology, especially as it pertained to rulers. The capital was first located in what was considered back then the center of the universe, or at least in Chinese reckoning. This was the city of Luoyang, which had witnessed from time to time the kings of Xia, Shang, East Zhou, and now the Han. But soon afterwards, Emperor Gaozu, upon the advice of his loyal advisors, moved the capital to Chang'an, or present-day Xi'an. From there, he was better able to keep his finger on the pulse of the constantly troubling northern barbarians, Xiongnu. His wife became Empress Liu and later Empress Dowager Liu. Liu Bang, uh, I, I say Liu Bang, Han Gaozu, Gaozu Emperor, all interchangeably. Uh, re he remained the same as he was during the time when he was a nobody in Pei County. He knew his success had plenty to do with being one of Fortune's favorites rather than being a great leader. He still caroused and partied with all his hangers-on from Pei County. And if you remember Xiao He from the story about how Liu Bang conned his way in to meet Lord Liu's daughter, he now actually served as uh, uh, Liu Bang's chancellor, Cheng Xiang. So great were Xiao He's contributions to the early Han period that he went down in history as 
Han Chu San Jie, or one of the three heroes of the early Han Dynasty. When Liu Bang became Emperor Gaozu, he had to buy off a bunch of leaders to get their support during this tender stage. He enfiefed seven princes who were not of the Liu family. They started plotting against him in no time at all, and took various measures to enhance their power, so the emperor had to find a way to get rid of them, which he did, or at least six of the seven. He then replaced these six with members of his own family, again, the Liu family. But these six, as soon as Emperor Gaozu dies, begin to do the same thing and build their own power base. Basically, the administration system set up by the Han consisted of 14 commanderies, or military regions, to govern the wild west of the Han Empire. And to the east, which was more populous and complex, uh, there were 10 aristocratic kingdoms set up. A hundred years later, these 14 commanderies become 84, and the 10 kingdoms become 18. The idea was to keep dividing these areas up into smaller, less powerful entities. And to keep an eye on things, regional inspectors were appointed who traveled the highways and byways of Han China, checking in with all the different regions and reporting everything back to the capital. This was straight out of the Qing Dynasty playbook, but the Han refined this kind of administration and bureaucracy. And you had this direct link between the central government, headed by the emperor, and the individual peasants who paid taxes, spent time in forced labor for a certain period each year, and of course, perform military service when demanded. The Han were quite successful over time in centralizing power and gradually breaking down the last remnants of the feudal system. One example, laws were put in place that called for feudal estates to be passed to all sons, rather than to just one single heir. That broke these fiefdoms down into smaller and smaller estates. Despite the sustained pressure to keep them from rising too high again, the Han aristocratic or gentry class continued to grow and evolve as the most powerful and influential social group. I suppose this is how it is almost anywhere, even today. The Gaozu emperor was known as a fatalist, and in April of 195 BC, he died from his wounds on a punitive expedition against the king of Huainan, Ying Bu. He was struck with an arrow and famously said to his empress Liu, who urged him to listen to the advice of his physicians, quote, I am only a common person and have won over the country with just a sword in my hand. It is the will of heaven that determines my fate. It would be useless, even if you sent for the most famous doctor, Bian Chue. Bian Chue, by the way, went down in history as China's first great physician. He lived around 500 BC in the Eastern Zhou Spring and Autumn period. You might call him the Hippocrates of China. So the great Liu Bang, Han Gaozu, passes from the scene, and what follows was a great big, in-your-face dose of Chinese imperial palace intrigue. Empress Liu takes center stage now, and has her weak son placed on the throne as Emperor Hui. Now, when Emperor Gaozu was alive, he had a favorite concubine. She was the beautiful concubine Qi. Qi Qi. She had a son with Gaozu named Ru Yi. Gaozu had considered Ru Yi as his heir, but backed out after terrible opposition at court, who insisted his son by Empress Liu should be the heir. Well, Empress Liu never forgot this, or the fact that the emperor had showed favoritism to his concubine rather than his empress. So later, 195 BC, after Gaozu was cold in his tomb, she moved on concubine Qi and the potential heir, Ru Yi. She had the prince poisoned to death in a rather gruesome and nefarious way. She then had concubine Qi arrested and, in short order, had taken her from the opulent life of the imperial court to the hell on earth that were the dungeons. There, the deceased emperor's favorite concubine sat in chains, head shaved, wearing prison garb, and also spending her days husking rice. But this wasn't enough. As Sima Qian wrote, and he should know since he came only seven or eight decades ex post facto, the wicked Empress Liu had her former rival blinded and had her tongue cut out and then all four limbs cut off and made her live in an underground pig pen. And she bragged about this to the court and referred to concubine Qi as the Ren Zhi, or human pig. When she proudly showed her handiwork to her son, Emperor Hui, Sima Qian said that Emperor Hui could no longer rule. So affected was he at the sight of what his mother had done to his father's favorite concubine. He lived out the rest of his reign traumatized at what he had beheld and 
went through the rest of his days in a stupor of booze and carnal pleasures and died in 188 B.C. He died, leaving two infant sons who became emperors Qian Shao and Hou Shao. But the real power lay with the regent, their grandmother, the Empress Dowager Liu. Now, all these years as Empress had taught her a thing or two, and although earning a reputation for ruthlessness, Empress Liu was also an extremely capable administrator and ruler. Right now, if you remember Emperor Gaozu, at the very beginning, he had installed these uh, people from the Liu family, uh, from his family, the Liu family, as princes in various lands. Well, as I said, they rose up, and Empress Liu, one by one, got rid of them, and little by little took members of her own Liu family clan and inserted them into these places of power. And she reigned until 180 BC and died. And with her death, we had the great Liu clan disturbance, as it was called, the Liu Shi Zhi Luan. Everyone from the Liu clan who had enjoyed the good life under their benefactress, the Empress Dowager Liu, were rounded up and executed. And her grandson, the puppet Emperor Ho Shao, was also deposed. This story of how the Liu's usurped power away from the royal family and the aftermath that followed served as a warning to later generations who meddled on a grand scale with the royal family. We're going to stop here and pick up next time with the ascension of Emperor Wen to the imperial throne. With Emperor Wen and his son, Emperor Jing, together they rule during the Golden Age of the Western Han from 180 to 141 BC. So please come back again next week as we continue our look at the Western Han Dynasty. We're going to come back another day and focus more on various aspects of this period that we just discussed today. So, for now, this is your humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, urging you to visit my website at www.chinahistorypodcast.com. Send me an email or a comment. Wow, we're only a couple decades into the Han. Centuries still to go yet. I hope you'll keep listening. Once again, I'm signing off from the lovely and quaint town of Claremont, California, home of the All-American Village Grill, located on the corner of Yale and Second. Join us here each week as we bring you another topic from Wu Qianyan, the Zhongguo Li Shi. So take care, everybody.